All right. Are we ready? You ready to see it? So there, the purpose of me doing this problem, all right, purpose of me doing this problem is just to show you again how this just keeps cranking higher and higher level, all right, tightening the screws. So when I look at this, I think, all right, I've got a cosine down here. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, right? Or I could say I have a sine, but it's 2x, right? But then there's a light bulb. That's a double angle identity, right? So I know that from this, I can get some sines and cosines. Let me, let me just start with that. What if I did this? Get everything in terms of sine x, cosine x, like this. Now remember, I, I haven't worked through these, so that's just my first instinct there. So from here to here, that's double angle identity, right? Now, I said that derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine, so it seems like I could maybe choose u to be sine or cosine here, right? If I choose my u to be sine, where's my cosine? It's here and it's down there, right? And it's all complicated down there. I don't like that. If I choose my u to be cosine, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. That's up here, isn't it? All kind of by, by itself. So let me try this. Let me go and rewrite the integral. 2 is going to come out. I'm going to put the cosine x here over 1 plus cosine squared x. And then I'm going to say times sine x dx. Does everyone agree that's the same problem? Any questions on what I did? You got the derivative of the bottom. Right? I haven't taken derivative of anything yet. All I'm doing is rewriting the problem. I'm pulling that sign out with the dx so it's nice and kind of in my face here. And then everything else is right here. And I'm about to make the substitution u equals what? Cosine x. Cosine x. So u equals cosine x. The derivative of that is negative sine x dx. And so I have what here? Sine x dx, but here's negative, so how can I fix that? Multiply negative 1 on both sides. So negative du equals sine x dx. So I'm going to replace this with what? Negative du. And I'm going to replace every cosine I see with what? Cosine x with u, right? All right, let's get this going. And I'm going to pull that negative, that negative on the du out in the beginning. Can I do that? Is that too much? So this becomes, the 2's already out here. That negative du that's going to be here, the negative is going to come out. So negative 2 integral, what's cosine x again? u over 1 plus u squared du, right? Yeah, this is from that negative. Is that all right? That's where we are, aren't we? Do you have a formula for that? I don't think you do. Yeah, I pulled that negative, you know, because this negative du, yeah. I just pulled it out in the very beginning. So you see I'm starting to kind of like do more steps at one time now? Yeah. yeah. Could you just rewrite that as like u over 1 and then 1 plus? U one over. Plus Can't do 2 because we have two, on, two terms on the bottom, one on the top. If it was the other way around, you could split it to 2. So look, hey, look, look. Here's the thing about integration. Substitu substitution works, right? We've seen it works in certain problems, right? There's nothing that says you can't make two substitutions in, in one problem. So let's start all over. Do you see something in its derivative? Yeah. U squared. What's the derivative of u squared? To u, right? I've got u up here. I'm off by a constant. Go for more than just that, though, for your substitution. 
How about 1 plus u squared? What's the derivative of 1 plus u squared? Still 2u, right? Do you see that? I'm going to do another substitution. But I can't use u because I already used u. So I'm going to use a different variable. 2 back in? 2 is just going to stay out there the whole time. All right? So here comes my second substitution for this problem. I'm going to call it, you want to go V or W? I don't care. I think I'll do W just because people don't like my Vs. All right? Yeah. I, I exaggerate my Vs like this because I, I used to confuse them with my Us. Those are my Us. So people think my Vs at some point start to look like Rs because I do them real hard like that. So I'll just go with W. All right. So W equals, what was it we're going to use? 1 plus u squared. We're going to grab the whole denominator. Uh, DW then equals, now be careful here. What's the derivative of 1 plus u squared? 2u du. Du. Instead of like, you know, 2x dx, it's 2u du because the variable is u. Pardon me? Right here? Uh, back in the problem, we replaced sine x dx in the integral. We replaced it with negative du, didn't we? And that negative on the du, I slid it out in the front and put it on the 2 that was already out there. So where's the 2u come from? dw? Oh, derivative of u squared is 2u. Derivative of 1 is 0. 2u du. Is that all right? Yes, sir. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of work with this a little bit. Sorry, I, I misunderstood what you were talking about there. I'm, I'm rewriting the integral just so everyone can see this. Here's the negative 2 out there. It's 1 over 1 plus u squared u, u du. So all I'm doing is just moving that u to the side here so you can, again, match this up with down here. Actually, no, down there. And then this is going to match up with this. You following me or not? I'm off right here, right? I have u du here, here I have 2 u du. So what do I need to do on both sides? 1 half. 1 half dw equals u du. So you ready to rewrite the integral? Wait, go ahead, ask. What's Leonardo's name in that movie? Jack. It's Rose and who? Jack. Jack? Jack. You all right? OK. That's right. All right, so here comes my new integral. My new integral is negative 2 integral of 1 over 1 plus u squared. 1 plus u squared was what? W. And then times u du, which is really for us half of dw. That's just barely on camera. OK. So now where are we? Pull that 1 half out. So that's just going to be a negative 1 out here, isn't it? And then 1 over d, integral 1 over w dw. So we're at negative integral 1 over w dw. And that's a formula, isn't it? Natural log w, but then there's a negative in front of it. Absolute value w plus a constant. Now, what was w though? So this is natural log of 1 plus u squared plus a constant. But what was u? Cosine x. So equals negative natural log of 1 plus cosine, not 1 plus, yeah, 1 plus 
cosine squared x, close off your absolute value, plus c. Yes? Hmm? Repeat what? OK, so what was w? So go back to where we made our substitution. w equals 1 plus u squared. We did that substitution. So you just go look back in the work. I already erased it. So that replaces with this. And then back in your work, we made very beginning, we made the substitution u equals cosine x. So that's here. And so it replaces. How come the negative doesn't uh, stream into the c? It doesn't matter because the constant is a constant. It, I'm not telling you if it's positive or negative. Okay. So the negative could go to there, but it's still a constant. Okay. That's a good question. But this sign out here never affects this number. It's just something. Plus minus That's right. It could be plus or minus anything. So that was the first problem where not only did we have to use a double angle identity, right? We also had to use substitution twice. Now, is that the only way to do the problem? I don't know. There might be another way. That's the way that I saw it, and so that's the way I did it. OK, we still have half an hour. <coughs> yeah, thank you for reminding me about that. You know, the thing is, I told you this already. Like, this is Cal 2, man. If you're not coming to Cal 2, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm videotaping it, so I guess you don't have to be here, but. There's no audio, right? Is it really? Yeah, I couldn't hear it. You guys have mic on the TV. You couldn't hear the audio? I could hear me. When? When? For the first day I came to class. Oh, I didn't come the first day because I was absent. So then I looked at your videos and I watched them, but it was like my style, I guess. No, the video should. They should all have audio. I don't think any of them didn't. One from Wednesday, you know, yeah, that's how I want to watch. I think they all, I think they all do. I try. Sometimes my batteries die, and this doesn't give me any indication that it's dead. So. All right, this is 33. OK, so just like the previous problem, it was the first time that we had seen that certain sort of double substitution. I'm going to modify this problem slightly. I'm going to make this to the 70th power. Only because, well, what I'm about to say. We have the power rule, right? The power rule allows you to take the antiderivative of powers if they're by themselves, x to the third power, x to the fifth power, even x to the 1 half power. Now, if this x wasn't here, theoretically, we could do 2x plus 5 times 2x plus 5 70 times, multiply it all out, collect like terms, and wouldn't we have a bunch of x's to powers? Yes. And then do each one using power rule? I put the 70 there to, to force you to not want to do that, all right? Like if it was a 7, you might be like, oh, I'll just multiply that out. And, I'll be all proud of myself because I can do that, you know, and spend half an hour multiplying that out. But if I make 70, no way. you're not going to want to, right? So I'm forcing you to do something else. So let's make a substitution. Do you see something and it's derivative? If, X, if u is 2x plus 5, what's its derivative? I think you said use 2x plus 5, right? What's the derivative of 2x plus 5? Yes. 2. 2, right? You don't have a 2. It's OK, though. If you don't have a 2, you're off by a constant. But you, you don't, you see something. You don't really see its derivative. It's there, but it's, it's just a number, right? But then I also have this x out here, don't I? So hang tight. You ready? Here we go. This is just one of those problems you're just going to have to watch it first. Let's make that substitution. I'm picking the most complicated thing I can without picking too much, right? Like I don't want to pick 2x plus... I'm saying 2x plus 5. We don't want to pick that raised to the 70th because the derivative, derivative of that would be 70 times 2x plus 5 to the 69th, which we don't have. So we uh, take the derivative there of 2x plus 5. We get 2dx. 
see we've got dx up there. Um, we're off by a constant because we have a 2 dx. So uh, divide both sides by 2 there. And now we got our dx. The problem, as I'm sure I'm going to point out here, is that we've got the x sitting out there in front. So um, there's our u. We've got u to the 70th power, and then we've got 1 half du will be there, but the problem is that x. We don't have anything to substitute that x out. We can't pull x out of the integral. Okay, x is our variable. It has to stay in the integral. And so now we look at our three equations, and we notice that in the first equation, we have a linear equation in x. So we should be able to take that and solve it for x. So uh, let's see what I do here. Subtract 5 from both sides. And then to get x by itself, we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by 1 half. And I decide to just put the 1 half in front because I know that eventually I'm going to just factor that out of the integral as a constant. So that's what x is going to be. And I believe at this point I should rewrite the integral. It's kind of weird watching myself do this and trying to figure out what I was saying. So there's my x, there's my u, to the, and there's my 1 half du. So here we go, rewriting it. Um, the 1 half times u minus 5, that's my x. Now I've got my u there raised to the 70th power, and then dx was 1 half du. And at this point, let's see, be factoring things out. I don't know. Let's see what I do. At some point here, I'm going to point out why this is a much easier integral to do than the previous one. <clears throat> so, got u to the 70th. So now I'm pointing out to you that w there's a huge difference between these two because um, in the numerator, that x right there cannot be distributed into the parentheses because you have order of operations which means you'd have to raise everything in there to the 70th power first before you would actually move that x in. So that's what I'm saying there. Um, but on the other one, the u minus 5 is raised to the first power, and therefore I don't have to do anything um, first, so I can just distribute the u to the 70 through. That'll become u to the 71. That'll become minus 5 u to the 70th, which is much, much better. So we'll be able to apply power rule <coughs> on those two things term by term and let's see what happens here I think I'm just saying how much I like math right now or something stupid like that mm. <laughs> I've got to do this for the next what, like 20 something minutes 25 minutes uh, one fourth, okay, integral now distributing that u to the 70th through, you get u to the 71st, 5 u to the 70th. Uh, it's all that whole quantity in parentheses du. And now I can apply my power rule for the integral from property 2. So I've got my one fourth, I'm going to put everything probably in a bracket. Yeah, so here's my antiderivative. So using the uh, antiderivative of u to the n is 1 over n plus 1, u to the n plus 1, I get 1 over 72, u to the 72, and then I'll have minus 5 over 71, u to the 71, and then close it off, plus some constant of integration, and We've got to replace our u. 
go back and substitute. Remember that uh, u to the 70, I'm sorry, u is equal to 2x plus 5. So I think someone had asked here, can we like factor something out or something like that? I'm just going to leave it. So I just take my u is 2x plus 5 and replace it in here. Let's see if I put a final answer. Yeah, this equals, I distribute the 1 fourth through there. So 1 fourth times 1 over 72 is 1 over 288. Then here's my u raised to the 70th, or sorry, 72nd, minus, now distributing again through with that 1 fourth. 1 fourth times 5 over 71 is 5 over 284. Then here's my u, and then to the 71st, and then my constant of integration. That's it. Someone's probably going to ask me what number this is. I think I point out here that there's a couple of things that you could probably do. You could probably you know, approach this problem and try different U's and make it work. Um, but I really want to just show you a clean, cleaner way to do this problem. Um, so I, I'm, I'm about to use the fact that I have two terms in the numerator and then in the denominator I have you know two terms but I can still split that into two fractions uh, just using properties of fractions so I think I'm gonna do that here oh there you go someone asked me what number it was It's a little different when I'm watching myself. I must talk a lot in class. All right, so here we go. I'm going to take this thing. I'm going to take the numerator of the first term, 1, and put it over the denominator, and make one integral out of that, and then add to it, because I have addition up in the numerator, the second term, x, and put it over the, the entire denominator. So I've just pulled that uh, fraction apart into two fractions. And by doing that, the first integral is a common formula that you can find on your formula sheet. It's the anti, I'm sorry, the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is going to be arctangent x. And then the other integral, well, once I get to it, oh no, I was saying here that I have a constant of integration, but I'm just going to wait and put the constant at the end of this integral when I'm done with it. So here, I'm going to notice that I've got something in its derivative. The denominator is quadratic, 1 plus x squared. The numerator is just x. So when I take derivative of 1 plus x squared, I should get 2x dx, so I'll just be off by a constant. So uh, I think I do that, and I actually did it all in, like mentally. This is the one I was saying I did mentally, and that you need to verify on your own that you know that that's going to work. So you the substitution I use was right there, u equals 1 plus x squared, and then you can do du, then you're off by a constant, blah, 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 blah. You'll get like 1 and half integral 1 over u du, and then the antiderivative of 1 over u du is natural log u. You still have the 1 half out front, and 
then you put it all in there and replace your u with 1 plus x squared. So, yeah. Should have put an equal sign there. Missing an equal sign in front of that arctangent. Oh, well. That's an equal sign. And these are dots. And that's a circle. In my hand, I like to move it up and down and up and down. <laughs> yeah. All right, come on. So this, I believe, was the first problem I did where it was a definite integral. So we have limits of integration 1 and 2. So when we go through this integral now, instead of getting an, a general antiderivative with the plus c at the end, this should turn out to be some number, some numerical answer, you know, if we can integrate it. So um, trying to look for something in its derivative um, at some point here. So the big question is, you know, do do we see it? And uh, probably going to hold off. I tell you, I'm just going to wait on the limits of integration, deal with that later, and just for now treat it as just a, an indefinite integral, figure out what the antiderivative is first, and then go back and use the uh, evaluation theorem to plug in the capital F of B minus capital F of A. Go, Robert. Hurry up. Yeah, no, not equals, because I'm not going to do definite integral. I, I'm going to make it a an indefinite integral right now. And I'm actually going to rewrite it in a different form, pulling that x squared out to the side. And that way, hopefully, I can see that the derivative of 1 over x is somehow connected to that 1 over x squared. Let's see if I show the work here. Derivative of that is something. So my u, I don't want to pick my u to be e to the 1 over x because the derivative of e to the 1 over x is itself so I don't I don't have two of those sitting there, so I have to look something smaller than just than the whole e to the one over x, and I pick one over x. Here's what I say: one over x is x to the negative one. The derivative of that is negative x to the negative two, which turns out to be negative one over x squared. And so we're off by a sign. Our derivative would be. Um, you know, off because we have negative 1 over x squared, but up in the integral we have a 1 over x squared. We can take care of that pretty easily by factoring out a negative 1. So, let's see. Yeah, I put it down good. u is 1 over x. du is negative 1 over x squared. dx. And now, so I can get everything to look exactly right, um, that negative 1 in front of the x squared on my du is going to have to be taken care of. I probably am just going to rewrite the whole integral and pull that negative out in the very beginning. Yeah, there's where I'm saying you have to multiply both sides by negative 1. Okay, so I show it. There we go. So now they match exactly. So we have integral e to the 1 over x, which was u, times negative 
du, but went ahead and pulled the negative out and just made it du. And the antiderivative of e to the u du off your formula sheet should just be e to the u plus a constant, and we have the negative in front. So we should get negative e to the u plus c. And that's our that's our general antiderivative, but because we have limits of integration, we wanted to um, go further with this. So that part I'm saying right there, all I did was found the antiderivative. Now I need to go back to the original problem and use the evaluation theorem. Oh yeah, and then I said I forgot to plug in the u, which was one over x. There we go. So now I go back to the original one. I'd probably rewrite the whole thing underneath there, but to save space and time, I just carried on from the top. So say, therefore, this integral is equal to negative e to the 1 over x. And then remember, with definite integrals, we can choose any value we wanted for c. And the, the c that we usually pick is 0 so that we don't even need to account for it. And that was that was just because when you do the F capital F of B minus capital F of A, those the C always cancels out. So um we have one there, two there. So now we need to first plug in two and then subtract from that what we get when we plug in one. So my answer is and I always I always seem to do this, two big sets of parentheses, one for capital F of B, one for capital F of A. So negative E, now plugging in 2, 1 over 2, and then on the other one, negative E to the 1 over 1, which is 1. And then I write negative, probably square root of E, because E to the 1 half is square root of E and then minus the minus becomes a plus e to the first power is e. And that's something you could figure out in your calculator as a decimal, but I leave it in its exact form, which means that there won't be any rounding errors or anything like that on your, calc like your calculator. If you do a decimal, it'll give you, um, you know, sums. it has to round. Your calculator is going to have to round at some point, so that would be an approximate answer. The one I put up there is the exact answer. All right, 10 more minutes of this. This is tougher than I thought it would be to sit here and watch myself. All right. Uh, odd functions. So this is where I'm going through and explaining, first of all, what it means to, for a function to be odd. A function is odd if, if when you plug negative x into it, you get the original function f of x, but negative. So, as an example, I put the function f of x equals x cubed. And then I say, you know, is it odd or not? So what we have to do is we have to plug negative x into it and then see what happens. Well, when you cube a negative number, it stays negative. So negative times negative times negative is still negative. So it really just turns out to be negative x cubed. And therefore, that's negative times the original function. So plugging in negative x right there gives you the original function negative, which is exactly what it means to be odd. Now, uh, if you have an odd function, there's a very nice property for integrals. The integral from negative a to positive a of that odd function is 0, and always will be. Just remember there, you have to be going from negative a to positive a. If you're going from like, you know, let's say negative 2 to positive 4, your answer is not 0. So here's where I explain the odd function. Whenever it's odd, what you'll have is the area to the right-hand side of 0. So the area between 0 and a cancels out the area between negative a and 0. So I, I'm going to draw the picture here. So the area under the graph there is some positive area. 
but it's symmetric to that area on the other side, which is negative. And remember the integral. Um, definite integrals give you net areas. So if you have two areas that are exactly the same, but one's on top of the x-axis, one's on below, then they cancel each other out. So you get zero. And then I go on to say something about even functions. Um, you know, if you have the same thing with even function instead, um, you can basically take the integral from zero to a and double that answer, and that would be your area. So, so here's me doing an example of what I just did, uh, an odd function. But I don't tell you that right away. First, I just put the function up here. And I go on to say that, you know, you can sit here and spend quite a bit of your day trying to figure out a substitution for this problem. You know, you can try different u's. You know, if you let u be tangent, then you need, you know, a secant squared in there. You don't have that. If you let um, u be like x cubed or x to the fourth, then, you you know, nowhere in there you're going to have the tangent x. And so there just seems to be like no easy way to pick a u and get everything to, to become nice. So the thing that should really like um, tip you off on a problem like this, that, that perhaps you're going to use the odd property or even property, is the fact that your definite integral goes from negative a to positive a, in this case negative pi over 4 to pi over 4. So because of that, I'm first going to check to see if this function is even or odd. So I write down the function. And then what I'll do is, like we did with the x cubed, I'll plug in a negative x, and I'll see what happens. So I go in here, again, if I cube a negative number, right, oh, and here's what I'm talking about, you know, be careful, that's kind of like the hint to you. Um, so negative x cubed is negative x cubed. And then if I cube, I mean, sorry, if I raise a negative number to the fourth power, it's, it's going to be positive. So nothing changed there. But now I have to look at what tangent of negative x is. And then I'm going to go to my formula sheet here, and I'm going to look at my pre-cal stuff. <coughs> and I'm going to point out that on your pre-cal formula sheet, um, somewhere on the like top right-hand side of, of that, uh, pre-cal stuff, it's going to state in there <coughs> that tangent of negative x <coughs> equals um, negative tangent x. So essentially a negative, you can rewrite that tan negative x with a negative in front, which will multiply times the x to the fourth and turn it into a negative x to the fourth, and then the x inside the tangent is going to become positive x. So we get negative x cubed negative or minus x to the fourth tangent positive x. And now we notice that that's very similar to the original function. If we factor out a negative sign, or negative one if you like, then that right there is exactly my original function right there. And just putting a negative in front of it just means that that's equal to you know, f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. And I think I put it there, yeah. So there it is. So it's an odd function, and therefore the integral is 0. So there's really no work here. There's no substitution. There's no trying to figure out, you know, can you see something as derivative? All you're trying to do there is just verify first that the function's odd, and then after you know it's odd, you go ahead and knock it out with that uh, nice property. Okay, <laughs> this is where I go and I tell you how I study, or how I do my work, you know. I get all my, my stuff, my erasers, <laughs> I don't even think I should be narrating this, but I'll I'll say it anyway. So I sit there with my calculator. I've got Wolfram Alpha up on my computer. I've got all my paper, big old stack of blank paper. 
Got my problems, my formulas, everything there. Got the TV turned off. Got a six pack of whatever sitting on ice next to me. And uh and then just go to work. So I'm trying to encourage you to do, you know, get some routine going, you know. Oh yeah, and I also mentioned here that each, each I do basically one problem per page. Sometimes I'll do two, you know, it just depends on the problem. But with these, you know, my, my work is nice and clean. If I have to rewrite it, I do. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to cram 30 problems onto one page, writing, you know, like in microscopic print. Um, if you want to go and do all your final work and convert it over to one page, that's fine. But um, I don't think anybody's to the point yet where you can do all these problems, you know, perfectly on the first try. You're gonna you're gonna make some mistakes. You're gonna be erasing. So, anyways, get together, study groups, help each other out, blah blah blah. Don't be Leonardo DiCaprio. I also mentioned in here about the uh, homework. Um, that n this next class I'm going to be collecting um, or at least checking to see that you've done at a minimum you know the, the odd problems that still remain in 5.5 .5, and then also um, the stuff from before but really you've got to get this 5.5 .5 stuff down so uh, we're almost done two minutes left Sorry, i got to keep going with this audio the way this program works. It's easiest for me to just drag this all the way out to the end. I think this is the homework assignment. <coughs> Boy, I hope this works, this recording, because if I have to go back and do this, I'm going to be very upset. So, page 306, 7 through 51 odd. Omit the ones I did. So, I did a bunch of those odds in class, so you don't have to redo them. Wouldn't hurt, but you don't have to. And then I say, after you do that, you should probably go knock out those evens. Try and do what you can with those and take a look at my videos. And uh, remember, remember, I did a video of all the solutions to the even problems uh, for 5.5. .5. I think it's uh, like 8 through 50 or something like that. So, all right, almost there, almost there. Next time, I'll I'm gonna try and figure out a way to figure out when my batteries die on my damn microphone because this is ridiculous. And I'm about to stop this recording. I think I said have a nice day.